Hey there, I'm Ushi Nunny, and this is the Siemens Advanta podcast, where we invite you to unlock the potential of IoT. And every episode, we chat with some world leading experts who can help us to make the vision of an optimistic IoT powered future a reality. And today, we'll be exploring IoT and cybersecurity and how to be inventive and safe at the same time. To help us make the right New Year's cybersecurity resolutions, we are honored to welcome two heavy hitters in the field, Dr. Henning Rudolph and Professor Thomas Brandstetter. Henning is the head of global cybersecurity strategy and business enablement at Siemens. Welcome, Henning. Thank you, Oisin. Happy to be here. Awesome. And Thomas is the General Manager and ITOT Security Specialist at Lime Security, member of the Review Board at Black Hat and Professor at De Montfort and St. Poulton Universities. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks, Eugen. Glad to be on the podcast. Brilliant. And the first question for you both, uh, what was your personal journey into cybersecurity? Why is it important to you and why are you working in the field? And we'll start with your good self, Henning. Perfect, Eugen. Thanks a lot. So I see three main reasons why cyber is a very interesting industry. First one is it's exciting and it's challenging. There's always something new, technology, attacks, cultural things, so always dynamic. Second one is the job satisfaction. So if you look at studies, 80% of cyber experts would always choose the field again. And third one is really the diverse skill set that you see in this industry, also reflecting on myself. So my background is not cyber. I come from automation. Then I went into management consulting, later on IoT and digitalization, and finally cybersecurity. Outstanding. That's absolutely brilliant. 80% of cybersecurity folks would stay in the field. If anybody's listening, you're thinking of a career change, keep that in mind. New year, new role. How about that? That's brilliant. And the same question to yourself, Thomas, what's your personal motivation for being in this space? Well, you know, Ocean, that's actually a bit of a funny story because the way uh, I got into cybersecurity is back in the late 80s, I didn't have an own computer back then. And uh, I went to the computer room of my mom's school. And unfortunately, I infected one of their machines back then with a computer virus. Oh. Uh, and back then, when I was a 12-year-old boy, I had to figure out how to get rid of that nasty virus. I actually had to go and see the headmaster. And he practically forced me into learning cybersecurity. And that stuck <laughs> until today. Yeah, And I really took his, his, his request serious. So today I would say I've been in cybersecurity for more than 20 years and I'm enjoying pretty much every day because as Henning said, it's really exciting. Many new things to learn every week. It's always about keeping up with the attackers. It's really a challenging job. That's what I appreciate. I can just imagine the feeling like the blood draining from your face when you found out that you infected the school with a virus. But I, I'm happy that this brought you into cybersecurity. Uh, and, you know, the benefits of that terrifying moment are being enjoyed by many companies that you work with. So we're talking specifically around cybersecurity in the field of IoT and IIoT. And sometimes it really seems to be the elephant in the room at conferences and the like, because it's sort of unclear who's responsible for it. Do you get the impression that people assume it's somebody else's responsibility? Thomas, starting with yourself, what do you think is the state of play looking like for 2021 in terms of this connection between IoT and cybersecurity? I really like that point that you made. Who's taking care of cybersecurity? And the answer to that is in 2021, it should be pretty much all of us. Everyone needs to do his, his fair part in cybersecurity. Mm. There has been this thinking that who's taking care of cybersecurity? It's the security department. Yeah. And that's just not true anymore. If we look especially at IoT environments where everything is getting interconnected, we have so much intelligence, so much software around us, pervasive. So it cannot be just this one single group. It's, it's a job that all of us have to take care of, at least to a certain degree. As for 2021, I think, mm, at least in the very first weeks, we still will be discussing the topic of supply chain security, because I'm pretty sure everyone remembers the attack against solar winds all the issues that the attackers have brought us at this point. So uh, there will be a strong focus on, on supply chain security in the next weeks and months to make sure that all the risks that we get in through different software suppliers, especially in large heterogeneous environments, are 
to a certain amount bearable from an enterprise risk management point of view. And I guess also that, unfortunately, uh, ransomware attacks will be a prevalent topic to discuss because this is something that also also board-level executives will need to focus on. Indeed, indeed. Uh, it's a good point. And I'd like to come back to that a bit later and maybe get some examples for both of you of the kind of attacks that you see out there in the real world. Um, but Henning, uh, moving over to yourself, it seems like there's a lack of clarity uh, as to whose responsibility this is within companies, particularly around IoT and around a field of digitization and moving businesses to the cloud, etc. Do you think this lack of clarity within companies can actually stop companies making the move towards digitization? Yes, thank you, Georgian, for this question. Honestly, I don't think that it can be stopped because cloud and uh, IoT, has, it has just so many advantages. So there, there's simply no good reason w why not to do it. And I see two th very different kinds of groups in industry now. right now. One group is the one that is resistant to change. They don't want to go to cloud. They don't want to do new things. For them, cyber quite often seems to be a good excuse why it's too dangerous and why we should reside in the status quo. So that's the first group. The second group is, I would say, the more adventurous one. They clearly want to embrace IoT. They want to go to the cloud. But quite often they jump at the benefits. They do lab prototypes. They see what they can do uh, with IoT, but they are not considering cyber, at least not in the early stage. And when it comes to a mass rollout, they need to refactor cyber into their digitization strategies. Mm. Indeed, indeed. And from the point of view of somebody who doesn't really want to do anything different, you know that old saying, nobody got fired for saying no. Uh, I mean, th they might look at the cloud and say, oh, it's, it's more connected and more connectable by its nature. It's all about this interconnection. Does that mean it's more vulnerable to attacks? You know, is there anything to be gained by not moving to the cloud? It's, it's very interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, a lot of decision makers said they would not go to the cloud as it's perceived to be more more dangerous. So that was roughly until I would say 2016. Mm -hmm. Over 50% of people said, no, we are not doing it. It's too dangerous. Wow. Since 2017, the trend has shifted. More and more people have realized that cloud is actually more secure than doing it on-premise. And th the reasons are pretty obvious. I mean, all these multi-billion cloud companies, they have deep pockets to do cybersecurity. They have a large array of experts and they know if they are failing in cybersecurity, their whole business is at risk. Very good points. I love that. Thank you. And let's actually get into the, you know, the euros, dollars and cents of this. Can we get a feeling for the benefit of connecting your business and digitization and moving into the cloud versus the cost? Are there any indications of the ROI? So I would, uh, I would start the answer to the question differently. So uh, I agree that still today, Currently, doing and investing in cybersecurity is, is mainly, you know, this, this, this classic cost factor. Depending on the actual executive, uh, he or she might consider, yeah, it's, it's sort of a hygiene for compliance reasons, so something they have to do anyway. But I've met, unfortunately, few executives that really understood already that cybersecurity is actually an enabler, at least for the future fully digitized industry. For a fully digitized industry, I would argue that cybersecurity is pretty much a prerequisite. You just won't be able to run your business processes or just your factories without disruptions if security isn't a core part, uh, if you haven't taken care of it. And then it's not just a question of uh, does it cost you money, but do you actually earn money uh, at that point? Indeed, it's, it becomes a question of how on earth can you afford not to do it? A bit like moving your business onto the internet and enabling e-commerce and all this stuff that we take for granted. Uh, there was a time in the past when people were, you know, maybe, oh, I'm not sure about this internet stuff. But now we know it's like, if you want to do business, you have to be online. So we've been hearing about this option. I mean, it's a terrible option. But the option of sitting on your hands, doing nothing, not digitizing, not connecting your factory to anything, wrapping it in cotton wool, and that way, it'll be safe forever. I mean, is that even an option in 2021? Starting with yourself, Henning. Right. Thank you, Eugen. And uh, to be very clear, that's a myth that needs to be busted. Already in 2011, this was not an option anymore. It's a myth that things can be air-gapped. 
There are still people running around with USB sticks. They use their service PCs. So you cannot protect by, by believing that your network is clearly separated. Yeah, very, very good point. And um, how about yourself, Thomas? What would you say to the, the concept of uh, shrink wrapping your factory against the world? Well, uh, that's an easy one. You just can't do it. Uh, it. It just won't work because there will always be the issue of how do you get your data that your production, your factories uh, actually generate out to the enterprise network? How do you cost analysis? How do you process optimization analysis on the enterprise side if you don't get production data out one or the other side? And I'm also not discussing the topic of how otherwise would you do maintenance with your suppliers, it's really just impossible at this point, I would say. Uh, the, this concept of air gapping, it's, it's not for 2021 anymore. Very interesting. And of course, insurance can only repair so much. Thomas, you, you're working in this field, you're seeing the results of these attacks and, and folks that maybe are not prepared. What kind of damage can be done to a company if the path to digitization doesn't have a focus on cybersecurity as well? Well, pretty much two key losses, I would argue. The first one is just reputation. So mm -hmm. depending on the actual impact of the attack, your customers will see that something bad has happened to your company that was related to uh, a cybersecurity incident. And that might directly affect your reputation and also the trust that your customers uh, have in your company and also to, to a certain degree in your products. So at the end mm -hmm. of the day, it will cost you money indirectly. It might also cost you uh, money directly because of uh, stock prices, for instance, going down or just plainly enough because your production really has been halted by a malicious adversary. And I'd also like to add something to the points that Henning made before. There is a misconception that I regularly uh, run into with uh, executives. Uh, what's the value of an insurance policy? I absolutely agree that it's not like I get insurance policy and I'm done because this is really just meant for the residual risk. Of course, mm -hmm. so we, we've been working with some of the largest reverse insurance uh, companies. And of course, for them, it's the same. You have to do your primary homework and then they will take care of the rest uh, of the residual risk and only then. And also, I mean, it's 2021. It's not like security is completely magic. There's plenty of help you can get out there. So sitting on your hands definitely is not a good idea. So please take this, whoever listens to this podcast, please take this as a mental note. I'm not saying, you know, everyone needs to get a contract with uh, Lima security. They could, right? They would be well advised, but plenty of options out there. So there is no excuse in 2021 where to start with cybersecurity. There's uh, lots of experts out there that can help you either with technical questions, but also with just the, the question, where do I start? How much security do I need? What should I do from a security organizational point of view? So uh, please take that with you. From what you're saying there, if a company doesn't have the right resources internally, they should reach out, connect with somebody like yourself, and you can kind of fill that gap uh, and bring your experience and your, your actual knowledge of what's in the marketplace there to, to come on board. So outsourcing or an internal team, you know, it's like you need to have one of them in place really to survive. Brilliant. Okay. And I'd like to move over to yourself, Henning. Now you see a lot of work that a lot of companies that uh, interconnect with Siemens are doing. You have some massive global companies, you know, who you work with. Are there any examples of a security breach that you can share that would maybe just illustrate how important cybersecurity is in our connected world? Well, there, there are plenty of examples and I'd, I pick one out of the, the lot. So one point in time, I, I got a call from a company that had recently been hacked and you could feel in their voices, there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of emotion. I mean, the systems yeah. were out, the experts were asked what happened and they simply didn't know. All they knew was that more than 15,000 of their devices had been infected in a time of under one minute. Wow. So it really spread like wildfire. Mm. And there were a lot, lot of questions in their head. So first question was, was there something we could have done? Second question was, what, what are we doing now? 
And the, the third question, and this typically comes months after the incident, is how can we be better prepared that it's not happening next time? Yeah. And let me just pick up on, on the first topic about could we have done something? And in almost all cases, the answer is yes. You could have done more. You could have done better. Like what Thomas said, put an organization in place, get prepared. You don't need to overdo it, but you need to have process people um, budgets and procedures in place, th that is a prerequisite. And then you also need to be prepared what's happening in the case you are infected. Because let's assume you have a cyber insurance, which this company had in this case, then you need to be able to clearly track what is the cost of getting the systems up and running again. Because you are insured, you can get the cost expense, but you need to be able to track them so that you can get the refunds later on from the insurance. Indeed. I mean, I, I can only imagine the pain of suddenly having over 15,000 devices turn into bricks within 60 seconds. It's a nightmare come true. And as you mentioned there, there's insurance, but think of the cost, think of the disruption, closure of business, you know, weeks or months of disruption after something like that. I can, I can just imagine. But Thomas, do you have any examples that can bring to life the importance of cybersecurity? What kind of Costs are we talking about here of not having good cybersecurity? Yeah, because it's 2021, we do have a number of good or bad examples, uh, fortunately. So if you look at some of the more, let's say, high profile uh, ransomware campaigns just from the last two, two or three years, there was, for instance, uh, the case from North Hydro, which was one of the largest aluminum producers worldwide. They had a financial impact, I think, roughly of 70 million US dollars because of a targeted uh, ransomware attack. And just, I think, one and a half years earlier, the NotPetya ransomware campaign or attack uh, cost Maersk, the Danish logistics company, roughly 300 million. I think this this is still something on the on the lower end numbers that I've read. Oh. So we are really talking about huge losses, huge financial losses, if you have a large uh, outage because of ransomware in an environment, as Henning said, where you have thousands and thousands of devices that that, that got infected. And to be honest, just from, from our own business, emphasizing the point that Henning made, we absolutely prefer to do projects where it is about getting prepared, getting things ready in advance. We don't like those projects. Unfortunately, we have other projects as well, where our task is negotiating with criminals how to transfer amounts of the asked ransom. You can learn actually a lot about negotiation uh, skills from those guys as well. Uh, it's, it's interesting, but it's definitely not the type of business that we prefer to do. But sometimes doing negotiations is the last option because there's no backup available and the other option would just be losing all your data and going out of business. And I, I would like to, to build on that, Thomas. Uh, I, I really like the the negotiation part that you were referring to. So in the negotiation, you typically always try to be in a position of power. And you just mentioned how important it is to have good processes and backups in place. That's something I can share. We also have a large hotline at Siemens and people call us when they have systems down, where they cannot do something. And for us, it's very clear. We identify in a couple of minutes the people that have good backups in place and the people who don't have backups in place. So the level of stress in their voice of the ones without backups, that's a complete different ballpark. And just on this topic to add, it's not only a matter of having backups, but you also need to have good process in place where you try out, are you able to restore these backups and get the systems up running again? I've seen companies that have been doing backups on thousands of systems for years, but then not once tried out if they are able to, to restore. In this case, luckily, there was not an incident, but, but they picked up for years they were running blind. That's something I definitely can encourage everybody to try out when they have time and when it's not a situation of stress. Absolutely. And as you're describing those phone calls, I'm just kind of imagining the feeling that Thomas might have had 
as he realized that virus was on the school. It's like an IT professional on the phone to both of you saying, ah, we've been hacked. We've had ransomware. All of our devices are bricked. Just that feeling of the blood draining from your face and the, your stomach churning. It's not a good place to be. I'm going to ask you both later for some uh, cyber New Year's resolutions as well. How can people avoid this? But speaking of which, you know, you both talked there about the importance of preparation because prevention is infinitely better than cure. And the cure is sometimes uh, extremely painful and expensive. How can people be better prepared for cyber attacks, particularly in the field of IoT? My take at this would be plainly, don't just invest in technology. Technology is important. Tools are necessary to, to do things more efficiently, but invest in training and invest in people. So it really should be about the shift away from, from just focusing on the boxes and the components into create a security program, build an organization that really maintains cybersecurity and that can follow up on all the issues that come up during regular operation. So it's really the shift for me from technology to people, knowledge, and getting everything wrapped up in a cybersecurity program. So Henning, let's talk about this in the context of Siemens and IoT. So you're often connecting massive companies that have been around for, for many years and they have global footprints, but there's a possibility they also have legacy infrastructure and legacy tech. I mean, how complicated is that to deal with? And, you know, where do you even start? Right. Thanks for this question. The, the, the start should always be with a consistent program. I mean, again, the question that you raised, who's responsible for cybersecurity and in, in IoT? and the answer from the past is mostly, well, in the past, it was unclear and probably nobody was really responsible. So then you need to set up a program. You need to set up who's doing what. And then later on, you have distributed responsibilities. You have people that organize cybersecurity on a, on a global scale, on an enterprise level, and they define what should be the rules, what should be the standard measures to put it in place in different locations. Then, of course, you need to have people in the different, well, either smart grids or factories or other OT environments that take care of cybersecurity on a daily basis. Mm. And, of course, your suppliers and your system integrators also play a vital role. I mean, the component manufacturers, that's what Thomas mentioned with the, the responsibility of the supplier and supply chain um, cybersecurity. You need to make sure that they are following the right processes. And also your system integrators, when, when they take the components from the component manufacturers, there's a lot you could do wrong when you are installing and setting up these systems. You also need to put them in place. And mm -hmm. last but not least, uh, cybersecurity is a life cycle challenge. So topics and, and components or systems that were good to begin with, later on, they deteriorate over time. There are new vulnerabilities found and, and you need to constantly update and keep your systems up in shape. That's something that will never stop, and you need to have somebody who's taking care of that. And you asked what should be done. I think, honestly, after you're setting up this organization, the most important topic is you need to know what you're defending. Mm -hmm. And what we find quite often is when you ask people, so what are your assets? How many are there? What kind of assets do you have? Most people do not know because their systems have been growing for decades, People shifted and there's no plan. What is really the attack surface? What is there to be defended? This needs to be baseline. And if I had to start after the organization, that would be my first step to do. Mm, yes, brilliant advice. And if you had a New Year's resolution, given we're at the beginning of 2021, if there was a New Year's resolution, you could invite the C-suite to educate themselves about, what would it be? I would talk, really give the new US resolution to being prepared. Yes. So the, the two instances that can affect you as responsible for your organization is either legislation. So you need to do something to be relevant to stay in the market. Yeah. Or it could be these professional cyber attackers hitting you. And that, that would be an incident that puts you in the news and could have impact on your evaluation in the market. Oh, yeah. So the resolution I would give, be prepared start to define your organization, start to define processes, really build up your professional organization to be better prepared for laws or for professional attackers. 
Very good. Strong New Year's resolution. I like that. Uh, thank you, Henning. And Thomas, what would your New Year's resolution for the C-suite be? So for the C-suite would be number one, make, if you haven't done it yet, make the issue of ransomware a boardroom topic. So you will need to be prepared to deal with explicitly the issue of ransomware attacks because it's not a question of if, but just when, uh, number one. And number two, go set up your own dedicated security program in your organization because by doing that, you will get the right people doing the right things with the right responsibilities, choosing the right tools, setting up the right controls. So everything will fall in the right place if you set up a dedicated organization, a dedicated program for it. Okay, and my New Year's cyber resolution would be to dance like nobody is watching, but encrypt like everyone is. Thank you so much to Dr. Henning Rudolph and Professor Thomas Brandt's letter for joining us today to talk about IoT and cybersecurity being inventive and safe at the same time. Listeners, if you enjoyed the podcast, please don't forget to tell your friends and subscribe using your favorite podcast platform. Also, do check out the Siemens Advanta website where there is a whole section on cybersecurity and change management. And we'll put some links to both of our speakers in the show notes. In the upcoming episodes of the Siemens Advanta podcast, we'll be discussing more hot topics like how to start the digital journey and why IoT is still a people business. See you next time.